Welcome to the NWR Virtual Resources Conference. We're going to go from gold into battery chemicals. And it's a really exciting one, Pure Minerals. ASX code is PM1. And here to share the story is Stephen Grocott. He is the CEO. Stephen, welcome. And over to you to present the Pure Minerals story. Thank you very much, Kerry. Maybe I should say this is the new gold. Um, yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the Townsville Energy Chemicals Hub project, the tech project. I joined uh, Pure Minerals a few months ago as CEO. Prior to that, I had a long stint with uh, Cleantech, Rio Tinto, BHP Billiton, um, a lot of time in the nickel game and mineral processing. Uh, before I joined Pure Minerals, I spent a couple of months doing my own due diligence, including reading through their 1100 page um, detailed PFS report. And what I want to do is tell you what I learned uh, from that exercise, what we've achieved over the last few months, which is quite considerable, and what we're doing in the future. So on to the next slide, which is not coming up. I have it. There we go. That's better. Um, you can speed read the disclaimer all by yourself at your leisure, but let me set the scene. Um, if you're going to produce a product, you need to understand the market that you're in. So here's a typical market forecast. This one's by Bernstein, but it's for nickel demanded batteries and uh, relates to the project pipeline as well. So the tech project is primarily a lithium iron battery nickel story, um, especially a high purity nickel sulfate story. Now, this graph shows the projected nickel demand of a few different scenarios from uh, minimal to maximal. It also shows, I've superimposed on there, um, I'll just bring up a laser pointer for you, superimposed on there, the uh, Tesla uh, projected or the Elon Musk projected demand. That is not included in this forecast. Um, so that alone, if that was to come to pass, represents half of the demand in the next few years. Now, this rapid demand growth is driven by government regulations around air quality, around greenhouse gas emissions, subsidies, uh, the superior driving performance of electric vehicles and the near total cost of ownership parity of EVs. Even if you take away government subsidies, that uh, parity crossover point is going to occur in the next three to five years. Now, note that this graph represents the nickel demand for the battery sector only. On top of that, there are 2.3 million tonnes of nickel demand today for stainless steel alloys, etc. So the battery grade nickel project pipeline is almost empty. When you listen down it, you hear a very large echo. So where is this massive demand, which is currently less than 5% of total nickel production going up to over 30% of total nickel production, where is that nickel coming from? Well, firstly, I'll tell you where it is not coming from. It's not coming from nickel pig iron which despite its massive growth over the last uh, 15 years, um, which has captured most of the stainless steel and alloy sector, that nickel pig iron can't be easily converted to battery grade nickel sulfate. It's very expensive exercise. Same applies uh, to ferronickel. Sulfide deposits, they're few and far between. Uh, grab them where you can, but they are still a long way upstream from the nickel sulfate sector. LME class one nickel that can be converted uh, with not too much difficulty into battery grade nickel sulfate at a relatively low cost. But, and this is a very big but, stainless steel and alloys still require some class one nickel. So if you take from nickel metal to convert it into battery grade nickel, you're robbing from Peter, which is the stainless steel sector, to pay Paul, the lithium ion battery sector. So you are going to run into a brick wall in the next few years uh, when nickel metal also gets into deficit. High pressure acid leaching will, uh, can and will supply some of that nickel sulfate demand for batteries. However, you have to be good and you have to be brave and you have to be prepared to roll a 12 sided dice and hope that you come up with a 12 because 11 out of the 12 HPL projects over the last few decades have failed not just failed slightly, they have failed miserably. Many of them have been uh, financial train wrecks. 
Furthermore, high pressure acid leach is relatively capital intensive and has a horrible sustainability footprint. It produces about 1.2 tonnes of tailings per tonne of ore. Well, that works about uh, at about four, four tonnes of sloppy tailings for every electric vehicle. Now, the electric vehicle market is a green market. Sustainability credentials, credentials are very important. Also, HPEL is very slow to develop, uh, typically more than 10 years. And even in uh, China slash Indonesia uh, projects, you're talking at least five to 10 years. Um, very slow and complex uh, ramp up in those projects as well. Mixed hydroxide precipitate, uh, that's a mixed nickel and cobalt hydroxide precipitate is something that many bad battery manufacturers seek to refine into nickel and cobalt sulfate. However, mixed hydroxide precipitate comes from HPEL, so catch 22. So woe to the EV and battery sector, what are they going to do? Where are they going to get their nickel from? Now the answer is you need everything that's available, even some of the above. But you really need something new and you need something different and something that satisfies the sustainability requirements. So enter the tech project. I'll just give an overview of that project. The first distinctive is we do not have a mine. Now, that may sound unusual. It's actually fantastic. We don't have the capital costs, the development delays, and the approval delays that come from that. Instead, we'll import high-grade nickel laterite ore from New Caledonia, a stable jurisdiction, a very short shipping distance from Townsville, where we ship it. Those, the mines that we are partnering with have supplied ore into Townsville to the now closed down Queensland nickel refinery for many decades. By the way, that Q&I refinery uses a very different process to what we are talking about, but more on that later. We take the ore into the port of Townsville. We take it 40 kilometres south to our processing plant, and we use the very nice direct nickel nitric acid leaching process, and I'll describe that a little bit further. We refine that ore firstly into a mixed nickel and cobalt hydroxide precipitate. We then refine that into nickel and cobalt sulfate using relatively conventional technologies again. We also produce a lot of byproducts. So the ore comes with a lot of iron and magnesium and aluminium. Now, typically in high pressure acid leach, they end up as a cost in your tailings facility. In our process, the direct nickel process, we refine the aluminium into high purity alumina, the iron into iron oxide, the magnesium into magnesium, and they all get sold as value added products. So recently, the attractiveness of uh, the tech project was recognized by LG Chem. LG Chem are the world's largest uh, lithium ion battery manufacturers. Uh, they signed an MOU with us and you can read the details there yourself but it's to develop an offtake for 10,000 tonnes of contained nickel per year. Now, what was the attraction of a giant company like LG Chem for a relatively small company like Pure Minerals and the Tech Project? Well, firstly, some of their attractions included, we are fast to market. And you saw from that Bernstein graph how urgent the demand for nickel is. So we're fast to market. We have by far the best sustainability credentials of any project that was out there. We're zero liquid discharge. We are near zero, zero solids discharge. In fact, we may be zero solids discharge. We have low greenhouse gas intensity. We produce a lot of co-products that decreases project financial risk. We have a scalable and low capital intensity and benefiting from our high grade ore and our co-products, we have a relatively low C1 uh, cash costs compared to uh, other projects. And we've got a relatively simple processing flow sheet. That processing flow sheet uses the direct nickel process, which we've licensed from Altilium uh, until recently known as direct nickel. You may have heard of them. What is the attractiveness of that process? Well, firstly, it starts with the ore body. Let's compare the direct nickel process with other nickel processing. Let's first look at HPEL. This is a profile of a nickel ore body. HPEL, pressure acid leaching, typically can only process the top half of the ore. Smelting can typically only process the bottom half of the ore. They're quite fussy eaters. The direct nickel process can process the entire profile. So the direct nickel process 
It's not vegetarian, it's not carnivore, it is an omnivore. And more importantly, to take the analogy further, it doesn't have food intolerances. HPAL and smelting have got some really fussy requirements around the mineralogy and chemical composition. So the fact that we can process the entire profile reduces the mining costs and uh, makes it easier to control the whole process. That's a, a lower process risk than many other processing um, flow sheet opportunities. I'll talk about our flow sheet here uh, now, just in overview. I won't go into it in detail. You can look at it uh, yourself later. But in summary, we use nitric acid leaching. Nitric acid is a very powerful acid. It dissolves uh, virtually everything in the ore. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, it doesn't dissolve conventional stainless steel alloys, so we can make all of our process equipment out of conventional stainless steel alloys. The process is very, uh, the nitric acid leach is uh, very effective. You don't need high pressure, high temperature to operate it. It's simple atmospheric pressure, stirred vessels. Importantly, we recycle more than 98% of the acid back into our leach circuit. Unlike pressure acid leaching, where you use 100% of the sulfuric acid that you use, which contributes to your tailings uh, problems. That means we have low operating costs and a greatly reduced environmental impact. Um, we produce a mixed hydroxide precipitate uh, if, uh, after the leaching process, and we produce a bunch of byproducts, co-products, uh, iron oxide, high purity alumina, magnesia. As I said, the process is relatively simple, scalable, stirred tanks, uh, fast to construct and uh, fast to ramp up. Typically, HPL plants take uh, four years to ramp up. Uh, the very best of them is achieved uh, in about two years. So fantastic, you say. Very nice process, very simple process. Why wasn't this commercialized earlier? Because it was actually developed about 10 years ago. Well, the next slide shows a timeline. What this timeline shows, firstly, is the continued fail or failure of HPAL operations. Just a long list of them are there. Continued failure of HPAL. It shows the boom in nickel pig iron, particularly in China and Indonesia, which became the lowest cost way to get nickel units into stainless steel and alloys. However, as I said, Nickel pig iron and ferro-nickel can't be converted into battery grade sulfate unless you have a very high nickel process. Now, the direct nickel process was attempted to be commercialized back here in the shadows of the GFC during a nickel pig iron boom, during a collapse in nickel prices. And worse still, there was no market other than stainless steel effectively. There wasn't an electric vehicle or lithium ion battery market. Today, times have changed. The Bernstein graph, today it's 5% of the nickel market, growing to more than 30% of the nickel market in less time than it takes you to develop a single HPAL plant from scratch. So the time is right. And as I've often said to people, I would rather be lucky than clever. And you couldn't ask for luckier timing to develop a project that is specifically designed to produce feedstock into the lithium ion battery market. Especially important to us and to potential off takers and investors are the environmental credentials. Nobody wants to get into their electric VW knowing that there's four tons of tailings from that nickel sitting at the bottom of the ocean in the, in the Pacific or in a Brazil style tailings dam in a seismically active high rainfall region. So in the tech project, we have the ore supply, we have the process, we have the recognition, we have the sustainability, we've got the market fundamentals and we've got the timing. What's missing? Location as always. Now, if I had to write a specification sheet for a location for this project, here it is in our location. It's got everything that you need. It's got the water, it's got the gas, it's got electricity, it's got communications, it's got uh, road and rail access directly from the port of Townsville. It's a gently undulating uh, piece of land, which is already zoned heavy industrial. Um, the rail and highway are the eastern boundary of our site. Tick, 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 um, enough said, um, very, very attractive location. Onto the project financials. Now these financials here are for our 
six ton, uh, 6 thousand tons of nickel production a year project. Um, recent discussions with LG Chem and other other suppliers are leading us to consider uh, doubling the size of that plant. But our PFS was based on a six thousand ton per annum nickel plant, and that's what I'll show you here. So you can see here that. Most of the revenue is from the battery chemicals, the nickel and cobalt, just over half of it. High purity alumina is about 30 or 40% of the revenue. High purity alumina is also a battery feedstock, but it's also, if you've got LED lights, uh, the glass is not a glass, it's a high purity alumina. And the byproducts, the hematite and mag magnesia are also important. It's it's not just that they are attractive revenue, but we are avoiding a negative cost of them being in tailings. This gives us 26,000 uh, tonnes a year of nickel sulphate or about 6,000 tonnes a year of nick contained nickel and the byproducts. The capital for the project is uh, 650 million. That includes a 15% contingency. Uh, EBITDA is about 260 million. Um, very attractive uh, payback IRR of just over 30%. Now, obviously we double the plant Capital doesn't double when you double these plants. In fact, it will still be, still be a single train plant. The only reason for the 6,000 ton PFS that we did be, was because we were a small company and that was the smallest economic unit uh, we could consider. But with financial backing, uh, our larger project is much, much more attractive in terms of IRR and capital intensity. Now, Importantly about this project, it's not, a it's not a technology risk. This is not a one or a zero project. You know, we succeed, it's a one, we fail, it's a zero. The, the only question is, is it a 1.2, is it a one or is it a 0.8? And we're at the moment, we're doing some piloting in Perth on the New Caledonian ore from our mining partners to try to turn that one into a 1.2. But this is a project which has been thoroughly piloted. It, uh, uh, the process was piloted in 2013-14, uh, over 11 months, 19 different pilot runs on a multitude of ores. And as I said, we're just doing some confirmatory piloting in Perth as we speak on ore from our New Caledonian mining partners. So here's a little snapshot on pure minerals and the project financials. As I said, the capital of the project is 650 million, EBITDA 260 million, uh, post-tax NPV, 1.5 million, IRR, 30%. Very, very attractive. Um, you can look at our um, own uh, market cap uh, there and, and share price. But investors in the tech project, investors in pure minerals, what do they get? They get a moderate project risk in an exciting sector, true exposure to the EV market. It's got the sustainability credentials. Now that might not get you a higher price for your nickel, but what it does do is it gets you investors who are prepared to invest and off takers who are prepared to take product. Um, most of the world will not take nickel or cobalt that is not sustainable, sustainably produced. So it's an attractive valuation for people who are getting involved, very strong fundamentals. You know, whether we are a one or a 1.0 or a 0.8, this is an attractive project. We have an experienced management team with many years in this uh, complex industry. Um, we're obviously aiming to create a lot more value through this project. So what's happening at the moment? Piloting I've already mentioned. We need to confirm the size of the plant, whether we do it at the PFS size of 6,000 tonnes of nickel production per annum, or we double it or make it bigger commence a uh, bankable feasibility study early next year, which is the gateway obviously to project uh, funding. Approvals process is already underway. It's a, a very clean green process. So we don't expect to have any significant issues there. So in conclusion, I'll summarize. We've got a well-considered risk mitigation. All of the unit operations in this plant are off the shelf. They are standard pieces of equipment, standard unit operations in commercial use in other industries. We've just put them all together in this process. Um, it's simple process, atmospheric pressure, scalable conventional equipment. We are fast to market. That is very important. We've got no mine to develop. Um, we have all supply agreement in place. We've got atmospheric pressure, simple construction. Um, so that's very, very attractive. Financials. Um, you know, if um, 
if we double the size of the plant, it's likely to be around about a billion dollars uh, or 650 million at, at half the size. Much lower capital intensity than high pressure acid leach. And we've got a very attractive C1 cost, in fact, a negative C1 cost because of our byproduct credits. It's a very clean technology. As I said, zero liquid discharge, possibly zero solids discharge. Um, if we're zero solids discharge, well, in fact, already, even if we're not zero solids discharge, we have by far the lowest, smallest environmental footprint of any nickel project in the world. We recycle nearly all of the acid. The site is perfect. Um, particularly pleasing is the availability of very highly skilled workforce. And we have an experienced management team. So thank you very much um, for the opportunity to present the tech project. Uh, you can see that I'm excited about it and hopefully you can see why I'm excited about it. And we look forward to having discussions with some of you in the future. Thank you. Stephen, thank you for that. Uh, very well, uh, it's a great presentation. We've got a number of questions, but we don't have a lot of time. So I'm gonna crack straight into these questions. Uh, first question is, does Pure Minerals own the direct nickel process IP or do you have exclusivity over it? We have exclusivity over it in the region around uh, Townsville, and we have a very close working relationship uh, with the developers of the technology, a company known as Altilium. Until recently, they were known as Direct Nickel. In fact, uh, we work uh, hand in glove uh, with them because you know, we succeed together in this. So uh, mutually, very well aligned. Um, but before I ask the next question, I just want to say I was so impressed when you said you read 1100 page PFS report. That that's, was, why it took, that's why it took me two months. <laughs> that I, was I, impressive. <laughs> um, Stephen, it go, is it, Townsville is, is a very interesting area and it looks like the port, you've got all the infrastructure, it's quite exciting. Um, is there some government support for what you're doing up there? Yes, in fact, just before the recent Queensland state election, uh, the Premier announced um, infrastructure funding for the industrial site. Um, just south of um, Townsville. So it's a zoned heavy industrial area with a number of projects uh, that are being looked at there. And the Queensland government will be um, putting uh, some of their funds and there will probably be Commonwealth funds as well into that. But you know, the great thing about the port is all the infrastructure is already there. There's not very much that we need. Um, the ore will be imported in fact onto the same berth that it was in, shipped onto for many decades. So there's not a lot that we need which is excellent. Um, got any major competitors, Stephen? I mean, it's, it, I know it's, a, it's an unusual, um, I guess, the, the way you're doing it, the process itself. Are there, is there much competition? Um, no, I don't, I don't think it's actually a competitive environment that's out there. It might be a competitive environment for funding in some people's minds, but the reality is the whole electric vehicle and lithium ion battery market is headed for a nickel supply chain train wreck. And I, I, I wasn't, speaking glibly when I said the EV industry needs every possible source of nickel. The fact that uh, we are a very good opportunity, and I think, I think the best opportunity that's out there, um, is almost irrelevant when they're screaming for absolutely everything. So it's going to float a lot of boats, and we just think our boat's the best one, and it'll be floating on the top. Okay, running out of time, so I, but I do want to ask this one. Uh, the MOU with LG Chem, I mean, that's a massive company how did they come across you did did they approach pure minerals or did you find them what, just tell us how that came about yes they had been uh, following the direct nickel process for some time and they knew quite a bit about it through some uh, partners that we have uh, we've been speaking to a number of north asian uh, battery manufacturers uh, um, so it was a mixture, but uh, LG Chem and Pure Minerals, we had discussions over a two month period. So this wasn't a, uh, let's just sign this MOU. It was a very serious exercise where they did their due diligence. Um, so we were really pleased that it was something where they were very, very careful. They did their homework. They said, we'd like you to have your project bigger if that's possible. We said, absolutely. Um, it's more attractive when it's larger anyway. So. Uh, very pleased the discussion we've had with them, but not just with them, but with a, a number of other potential off takers we're currently in discussions with. Stephen, as you said earlier in the presentation, right place, right time. It's all in the timing. Thank you so much for presenting with us today. If people would like to ask more questions, please make sure that you contact NWR and they will get those questions to Stephen. For now, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Kerry.